Hi, welcome to Gateway Church's online service. My name is Nathaniel and this is Emma. We're really pleased that you found us today. Now we like to start our services by reading from the Bible and Emma's going to do that for us now from Psalm 85. You showed favour to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Saviour, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. But let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. We're coming today to a God of salvation and a God of righteousness, and it should cause us to want to rejoice. So we're going to hand over to the band in a moment who are going to help us rejoice through singing. So wherever you are, sat at home, we hope that you're able to engage. And I'm just going to pray for us really quickly that we would meet with God wherever we are. Lord Jesus, we thank you for a chance to come before you today. I pray that you would still our hearts now, that we might focus on you through the words of the songs and the Bible readings and the preach, Lord. We want to get closer to you today. I pray, Lord, that you would come and meet us where we are, that we might know your salvation and be able to rejoice in you. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Amen. Over to Hannah and the band. Okay, let's use these songs to worship Jesus and lift God up. Sing together, the lion and the lamb. Every 
stop, Lord Almighty. Who can stop, Lord Almighty? Who can stop, Lord Almighty? Who can stop, Lord? Who can stop, Lord? fix our eyes upon Jesus. Let's continue to push into his presence.
Thanks so much to the band there. Now, before we hand over to Matt for today's preach, we've just got a few news items that we want to share with you. Firstly, as you will know, we've been meeting together physically on a Wednesday and a Thursday night. It's been so good to be together in a way that adheres to government guidelines, of course, but allows us to be community together in the same room to hear God's word. And we'd love for you to join us. So please do keep looking out throughout August. We're going to keep meeting Wednesdays and Thursdays, Wednesdays at 502 Thursdays at Ashley Road. You can sign up through our social media accounts or on the mailer every time it comes out on a Tuesday. But please do look out for it. We would love to see as many of you there as possible. And now it's time for those of you with children to set up a second device um, so that they're able to enjoy and join in with the children's work this morning. Wonderful. And it's over to Matt for our last in the Out of the Wilderness series. Okay, we're in now. Uh part six, the final part of a series we've been doing called Out of the Wilderness. And tonight's message is called Waiting for the King. We've spent six weeks uh, in which we've been emerging from lockdown, six weeks in which we've been having physical gatherings like this. And we've been trying to feel our way through that. We've been wrestling with all the complexities and the uncertainties and the unknowns of this time, of which there are many, and we're still trying to feel our way forward in terms of things, how things proceed going forward. Uh, we are hoping that in September we'll start to have um, uh, uh, Sunday gatherings in some form. That's what we're aiming towards and working towards. Um, we're also working towards, when we do gather, having some more live worship. So we are allowed to have somebody singing if they're behind a screen. So what we are going to do is we're buying some plastic screens so that we can then have a band with one person actually singing, which I think will make the whole thing feel more easy than watching a, a video. So those are some of the things we're trying to do. But everything, you know, is provisional. It all depends what happens, what rules come down the line, uh, what changes. So any plans we make are only as good as the uh, next announcement by the government and whatever happens with the virus. But we spent these six weeks in which we've been looking at the example of the Israelites as they came out of slavery in Egypt into the wilderness and then into the promised land. And the kind of key verse, the framing verse for this series has been 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, which says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. The, what happened to the Israelites serves as an example to us, uh, but we are the people on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Jesus Christ has been revealed and, uh, and has made himself known to us. Now, these Israelites, they had a great leader. They had Moses. They had Moses who led them out of Egypt, led them out of slavery. They had great promises, the promises of freedom, of coming out of slavery into freedom, to the promised land, of being God's people, God's house, of entering a place of rest. And they had a great God. And yet the tragedy of their story was that they messed things up again and again. And what 1 Corinthians tells us and uh, what the Bible tells us repeatedly is how the people of Israel fell into idolatry. They worshipped gods other than the true God. They fell into grumbling, moaning, complaining. They fell into division and arguments between themselves. And uh, so often, rather than living and proceeding in faith, they were shaped more by fear. And the Apostle Paul warns us here in 1 Corinthians 10 not to be like them. And the warnings are real because the dangers are real. The dangers of falling into the same mistakes the Israelites made are always real, but I think especially at this time, this isn't what Paul warns us here, isn't just theoretical, it's real for us that the, the pressures, the complexities, the uncertainties of what we're living with at the moment could make us more prone to fall into this kind of mistakes that the Israelites did. And uh, this season we're in is just increasingly complex. When I got home at the weekend on Sunday evening, I met with John and Richard because they're both on holiday this week, so we wanted to catch up and uh, talk about things. We were talking about 
plans for the next few weeks. And everything we talked about, every plan we've got, every idea we had, there's something complex about it, something unknown, something unpredictable. It's all provisional. It's all we, we can't be quite sure. We would like to do this, or maybe we should do that, but will we be able to? Or will we have to change our plans? And I know talking to other people in the church since I've been back, uh, some of the things that people are fa- facing in their personal lives or in their work lives, just the, the complexity and the uncertainty of this time can feel pretty overwhelming. Now, in today's message, we are out of the wilderness at last. We're going to be in the book of Judges. And the people have come out of Egypt, come out of 40 years in the wilderness, entered the promised land at last. But rather than everything being fixed and sorted, actually things get more complex. Uh, If you've got a Bible to hand, it might help you to look at the book of Judges and uh, just follow the passage as we go, I'm um, going to kind of scoot over Judges chapter 1 and then spend some more time in Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 1 gives a broad kind of bird's eye picture of what is going on. It gives a picture of what is happening to the people in the promised land, how, how they're conducting themselves in terms of military campaign to occupy the, the land, how they're conducting themselves politically in terms of who's taking leadership, and it's also theological, how the people are relating to God. It gives that big picture, and it describes the ups and downs of them coming into the land and seeking to possess it. This is what it says in verse 1 of Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah shall go up. I have given the land into their hands. The men of Judah then said to the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. Joshua, who led the people across the uh, Jordan River into the promised land. He dies and everything changes and the question arises, well, Joshua's dead. Who's going to lead us now? And the people go to God, go to the Lord, go to Yahweh and say to him, who will lead us? Now, that, that's good that they ask God about who should be leading them. Who will go, go first? Who's going to represent the people, the whole people of Israel before God? And uh, Judah is chosen, the tribe of Judah. And this, of course, points to the coming king. We know that uh, David, the greatest king Israel ever had, was of the tribe of Judah. And Jesus was, humanly speaking, the descendant of David. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was the great king for whom the people were waiting. And so the fact that Judah goes first this time points to the king who's going to come. And we also see some brotherly cooperation between the tribes. The tribe of Judah say to the other tribe, the Simeonites, come with us. And the Simeonites say, okay, we'll go with you, and then you can come to help us. There's some brotherly cooperation, and that's good. When they cooperate together, good stuff happens. And there's a principle for us in that, isn't there? That when there's brotherly cooperation between us, things go better than when there's not. And... uh, At this time, it's so important that we speak well of one another and think the best of each other. There's brotherly cooperation between us so that things can go well for us. And then the middle third of uh, Judges chapter 1, verses 17 through to verse 26, describes the mixed fortunes of the people trying to occupy the land. They go into battle, and some of the battles they win, and some of the battles they lose. And then we get to the last third of uh, Judges chapter 1, and we see a stalemate between the people of Israel and the Canaanites in the land, that the people of Israel fail to conquer the land. They fail to fully occupy it. And the way that chapter 1 of Judges finishes is like this. It says, the boundary of the Amorites was from the Scorpion Pass to Selah and beyond, the boundary of the Amorites. What this shows us is that the thing which counts this time is not Israel's borders, but the borders of the Amorites. Actually, the Amorites have more authority than the Israelites do. Things have not worked out as they should have done. And we can imagine the people of Israel at this time kind of looking around at one another and thinking, 
hey, this isn't what we were expecting. We thought it was going to be much easier than this. We thought it was going to be much simpler. We thought we'd enter this land and everything would fall into place and it would all be more straightforward, more simple. And I'm guessing that over the last few months, many of us have been through moments like that where perhaps we've looked around at what's going on in society at large or maybe in our own lives and we thought, I thought it was going to be more straightforward. I thought it was going to be more simple. I didn't think this coronavirus thing was going to work, last as long as it has and be as complex as it has and there to be so many things which we still don't know and so many things we're still uncertain about and so many things we still can't be sure of. Maybe that's where you are this evening. We get through the bird's eye view of Judges chapter 1 and then we get into Judges chapter 2 and things take a more tragic turn. It says this, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I've also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bokim, which means weepers. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. Now, the place where this uh, remarkable scene happens, Gilgal, is significant because the angel of the Lord had previously appeared at Gilgal. The angel of the Lord had appeared to Joshua at Gilgal before the people went and uh, attacked and defeated the city of Jericho. And so when the angel of the Lord again appears in Gilgal, it's a reminder of God's rescue. It's a reminder of God's grace, that God is the God who has rescued and saved his people. But this appearance of the angel of the Lord not only comes as a reminder of the grace of God, it also comes with a rebuke. Because the people of Israel have come to terms with the Canaanites. They've kind of decided that we'll just settle down and we'll live with the Canaanites. We'll live like the Canaanites. And that isn't an acceptable option for the gods of Israel. The question always is, which god, what god will you Worship. Which king are you going to follow? And I think really the whole point of the book of Judges is to make us ask this question of ourselves. Who are you going to follow? Which God are you going to serve? Which king are you going to look for? And so there's a real problem for God because God has sworn to give the land to the people of Israel, but he's also sworn not to give it to a disobedient people. So What is God to do? That's the big picture view of what is happening at this time. And then as we get further into chapter 2, the story kind of loops around and some of the details get filled in. Let's pick it up at verse 6 of Judges 2. It says this, After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gush. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord Lord, nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And one of the problems for us when we um, read through the book of Judges is, as we read it with our 21st century eyes, 
that the book of Judges can seem rather racist because every reference in the book of Judges to the surrounding nations is always negative. And that's rather different from how we like to think in our uh, contemporary world where we think about every culture and creed having equal value and worth and dignity. And so as we read the book of Judges and as we read about how hostile God seems to the surrounding nations around Israel, we, we've got to understand the bigger point of what, of what is being described here. And that's what the peoples, the peoples around them, as it describes it here, what they represent. What the peoples around them represent are a rejection of Yahweh, a rejection of the God of Israel. These nations refuse to worship the true God. And the danger for Israel in that is that they in turn start to reject God and they in effect become Canaanites themselves. Now it was meant to happen the other way around. It was meant to happen that the other nations would see the example of Israel worshipping the true God and they too would become followers of the true God. But that's not what happens here. In Leviticus 19, we're told about how the people of Israel are to welcome foreigners amongst them. It says in Leviticus 19.34, the foreigner residing among you must be treated as native-born. The whole point was that the other nations were meant to come and join in the worship of God. But what happens here is that the people of Israel will go and worship the gods of the Canaanites. And God makes an exclusive claim. He says there can be no compromise with idolatry. With our faith as Christians, our faith is all embracing. The message we share, the gospel we have, is for every nation, for every tribe, and for every tongue. It is all embracing, but it is also utterly exclusive because we say there is no God but God. It is only through Jesus Christ that you can be saved. And this does give an offensiveness to the gospel, that we say to everybody, you're welcome, but we say to everybody, you can only come through the door that is Christ. Now, in the book of Judges, the people of Israel reject the true and living God. And as a consequence, things end up disastrously for them. And and here in Judges 1 and chapter And Judges chapter 2, it sets up the rest of the book, which is really an extended warning about what happens if you give up serving and following the true God and become an idolater, worship false gods. The very last verse of Judges, Judges 21, 25, says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And that everyone doing as they saw fit is not a good thing. It's not, they're all free and happy and enjoying themselves. No, it's anarchy and chaos and lawlessness and disaster and misery in the land. Now, how did it get to this? How did it get to the place where the people who'd been led out of Egypt by Moses, then had Joshua lead them into the promised land, who had all the promises that God had given, how did it get to the place where there was just kind of an anarchy and a terrible mess in the nation. Judges 2, verse 10, tells us that there was a generational shift. Joshua and his generation die, and then a new generation emerges. And this is a generation which is new, not only in being younger, but also new in terms of their values and beliefs. And it says that they didn't know God. I'm guessing they knew something about God, but that's a knowing of they didn't trust God, they didn't love God, they didn't follow God, they didn't serve God. For them, the worship of God had become something which was just part of their kind of cultural, national history. It has ceased to be a living relationship with the true God, just something which was kind of cultural baggage in the background. And that happened remarkably quickly. In just a few years, different generation arises, different in character, as well as different in time. Now, the same thing can happen in churches today. You can have one generation who fervently love Jesus and follow him. Have a next generation who seem to follow Jesus, but 
It becomes less and less about the heart and more and more just about cultural traditions. And then you have another generation who abandon the whole thing. For those of us who are parents, this is a salutary reminder to us. We can't just assume that our kids will be faithful. Can't just assume it because they've grown up in church, that they will themselves be faithful to God. It's too easy for faith just to become something which is kind of a habit. Go through the rituals. Go to church. Do your bit. The tragedy of our culture, of our nation, is how much that has happened. How often churches have died. The buildings have emptied. Because what was living faith has just become a a dead relic. We mustn't let knowing God slip into just knowing about God. And the thing about the Israelites rejecting God isn't that they just end up in, kind, in some kind of religious neutrality. Actually, what happens is they switch gods. They stop worshipping the true God, but they start worshipping the gods of the Canaanites. We sometimes talk about somebody being godless, but really there's no such thing as a godless person because every human being alive has something which is their God, that functions as their God. In this Canaanite culture, it was the Baals and the Ashtoreths, these were fertility gods. And the idea was that they would worship them in order to get something functional. If we worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths, then the crops will be good and the animals will multiply and will be provided for. Today, in the 21st century, the gods are still basically the same. They're not called Baal and Ashtoreth, but they're still basically the same. People worship functional gods. If I have this relationship, if I have this job, if I have this possession, if I can get my kids into this school, then it will be okay. Now, Israel abandoned relationship with the one true God for something which was false, and it didn't bring them into freedom. Actually, it brought them back into slavery. They've been delivered from slavery, but they're carried back into it. That's what idolatry always does. And we get to verse 14 of chapter 2 of Judges, and it says that they were unable to resist the the peoples around them, the very people whose gods they were now following. It was like they were saying, if we become like you, if we do the stuff that you do, if we worship the gods that you worship, then we'll be okay. But that's not how it worked out. They ended back in slavery. And again, there are obvious parallels for us in the church. If we do things the way of the world, then all that happens in the end is that we're unable to resist the ways of the world and we end up in slavery. What the people of Israel needed was someone to sort out this mess. And the book of Judges is full of heroes who arise. God gives heroes to his people who are sometimes better, sometimes worse at fixing things up and for a time getting the people out of the mess that they're in. But there's never a real solution. And in the end, it does all end in anarchy. And it ends with everyone doing as they saw fit. This was the people who'd had Moses lead them and then Joshua lead them. And it still wasn't enough. What they needed was a king. What they needed was the king. Now, we know that that king is Jesus. We know that Jesus is greater than Moses. We know that Jesus is greater than Joshua. We know that Jesus in his faithfulness is greater than the rebellion of his people. We know that Jesus has upended everything by his death and his resurrection. We know that Jesus is forever our immovable rock. We have the rock solid certainty of his death defeating death. Paul warns the Corinthians, says, well, all that happened to the Israelites happened as a warning to you. But Paul also says this to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So many issues confronting the Christians in Corinth. 
They were living in a complex world, in a very complex and a very difficult situation. But in all the complexity and the uncertainty of their lives, what they needed to know, who they needed to know, was Christ, the crucified King. He's who we need to know too. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the people of Israel falling into idolatry, falling into grumbling, falling into division, falling into being led by fear rather than by faith. Let's not turn from the one who is able to rescue us. And so at this time, with its extraordinary complexity and its mind-bending uncertainties and all the things that we're wrestling with, whatever your need is, whatever your fear might be, whatever your concern is, let's reach out to him. Let's reach out to Jesus. In these complex, uncertain, frightening times, let's reach out to him. Let's trust him. Let's believe him. Let's love him. Let's follow him. He's our king. Let's be faithful to that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the king for whom the people of Israel were waiting and you have now been revealed. And thank you that you were revealed in a way which confused everyone, came as a king, not as was expected in pomp and with military power, but you came as the servant who died in the place of your people and carried their sins so that they might be reconciled to God. And thank you that we have now been caught up in this too. Thank you, Jesus. You died for us and you now reign for us. And I pray that we would be faithful to you as you've been faithful to us. I pray that we wouldn't make the mistakes of the Israelites. I pray at this time when it feels like we're in a wilderness season trying to navigate our way out, I pray that we would not make the mistakes of the Israelites. We wouldn't fall into idolatry. We wouldn't fall into grumbling. I pray that we would be led by faith as we follow you. And we'd be faithful to you as you have been faithful to us. Thank you for the rock, solid hope and certainty we have in you as everything else shifts and shakes. Thank you that we can trust in you, Jesus. Amen.
Wonderful. Well, as we go, let me just pray for us. Lord, I do thank you for the words of our Out of the Wilderness series, reminding us that through this season and the next, whatever life holds, we can do so with you as our strength and our comfort mm -hmm. and our encouragement, that we can rejoice in who we are in you, Lord Jesus. I'm so thankful for that, Lord, and I do pray that as we go about the rest of our week, we would have Matt's words ringing in our ears, Lord, that we would be focused on you and who we are in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have any um, questions or would like to know any more information about Gateway Church, please do contact us at info at gatewaychurch.me. Wonderful. We hope to see many of you next week, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Look out for it in the mail or on our social media and please do sign up. Other than that, we're right back here next Sunday for another online service. So we do hope you'll join us then too.